Hello. I recently read a, an article by Neil Shenvey talking about Netter, N-E-T-T-R, which stands for No Enemies to the Right. It's an interesting political movement that I wasn't aware of the acronym until yesterday, but I was aware of the concept for a few years. Um, and he had a good article about it. I wanted to read through it. And once I read through it, I thought it'd be a good thing to talk about. Uh, Neil Shenvey identifies three major points of uh, Netter and what exactly it is, what he believes is its strongest iteration. Those points are, and I have those on my screen over here, the left is an existential threat. Consequently, Christians are morally obligated to oppose the left. And since opposition to the left will be weakened by criticizing people to the right, Christians should not publicly gr criticize people to their right. Now, those are the three points that he believes are the most strong. I probably would not have phrased them that way. Um, for instance, point one, the left is an existential threat. I probably would expand out to the left is an existential threat to humanity. I would add a point in between one and two saying that is a moral issue, um, just so that two does not feel quite as disconnected to being consequently Christians are morally obligated to oppose the left. So Shenvi, in his attempt to steel man the Netter movement, gives five major reasons why Netter adherents do the things they do. I also have those on my screen, so I'll go ahead and read them in order. The first one is that conservative criticism of allies reinforces the left's framing. And then he uses racism as an example. If conservative Christians are sitting there too busy condemning racism every time it is brought up as a charge against someone that is a conceivable political ally, then Christians are wasting their time on condemning racism, whether it exists in the instance that is uh, the subject of the debate or not as opposed to debating something that actually ends up mattering in the context. The second example that he gives is conservative policing of allies strengthens the left stereotypes. So once again, with the racism example, if you say something like, I condemn uh, racism from insert figure on the right here, then you are just drawing attention to the fact that there are racist conservatives, um, which would strengthen the left-wing position that all conservatives are racist, the third criticism that he gives is that rightward criticism is a distraction. So if the right is too busy condemning right-wing errors, then they're not doing what they are actually supposed to be doing, which is combating the left. The fourth that he gives is that ignoring fringe elements on the rights makes the mainstream right look more sane by comparison. Basically, if you don't draw attention to the fact that your side has crazies, people are a little bit less likely to notice that your side has crazies. And the fifth one is that the Overton window has shifted so far to the left recently that we should not oppose anyone who wants to move it back towards the right, however they end up doing that. Shenvi ends this section by saying that Netter advocates point out that the left has engaged with these very tactics, and objectively they have, that's not necessarily... Uh, an untrue statement that the left has done that. Um, the issue that Shenvi has is whether or not Christians should be willing to engage in those same kinds of behavior, and that is what the rest of the article is about. So Shenvi ends up breaking down the rest of his article into two more sections, one in which he gives theological issues with the netters, and then uh, some more practical political reasons to oppose the netter uh, ideology. Um, I am actually not that interested in the practical political reasons because he is writing this article for a Christian audience, which means that Christian theology is the ultimate arbiter of what Christians should do. The practical consideration only ends up meaning anything if it passes the theological test. So he points out, like the netters themselves do, that the left engaged in all these kinds of tactics before. They actually ended up doing the same thing through uh, with Christians. Uh, convincing a fairly substantial number of Christians that the uh, left was correct about certain things in certain policies, 
which ultimately didn't lead towards the left becoming more Christian. It led towards the Christians that were amenable towards these leftist ideas becoming more and more amenable towards these leftist ideas, which end up becoming more and more anti-Christian. I think this is actually a very good criticism of the slippery slope, which ends up not actually being a fallacy whenever you're watching it happen. So he demonstrates that this has happened before. What the netters are doing has happened, but they seem to not realize that it really only helped the radical left. It didn't help the Christians that ended up aiding the left at that time in any capacity. So I'm going to go through why I think theologically each of the five netter propositions that uh, Shenvi lays out here don't end up working from a theological perspective. Shenvi has his own sequence of reasons. There's probably going to be quite a bit of overlap between my reasons and his. In this case, I think, though, that I might be able to phrase something slightly differently, and it'll help me think through things. Maybe it'll help someone else think through things. So let's start with number one. Conservative criticism of allies reinforces the left's framing. So... Using the racism example of how if we end up bringing up racism, it just kind of reinforces the idea that racism is so pre uh, prevalent, even if it isn't, or if it's the central in ish it's the central concept in an issue, even if it isn't. In this case, I almost agree. I would instead say that Christians have to phrase the issue on biblical grounds. And so, for instance, you have the issue with the left using the word racism in a way that is completely foreign to how it was used until about 20 years ago. The leftist definition of racism is privilege and power, and I believe that's the definition used by um, Ibram Kendi. That is not how the Christian views racism. So whenever someone on the left uses the word racism, the Christian should recognize they are saying privilege and power, not what the Christian understands racism to be. The Christian understands racism to be partiality, that is showing preference to someone uh, for one reason or the other, but it's partiality on the basis of race. You are showing partiality to someone on race. You are giving them something that you wouldn't give someone else because of race. That ends up being the issue. So the Christian should stand on the Bible and say, we must oppose the discrimination on the basis of race. We should not flippantly assume that people know what we are talking about whenever we say we oppose racism, because the definition of racism used very frequently very, very commonly around at na right now is not the way that the Bible understands racism. It is completely different, and we need to be clear about that. I believe that by being clear, we are, one, not muddying our theological waters because Christians are not allowed to care about race. It is not something that Christians can do. But also, we have to oppose the leftist definition of racism, we can't just assume they're talking about something good because their definition of racism is not good. It is not valid. It doesn't make sense. And it's completely incompatible with the way Christians view the world. So the second point made, conservative policing of allies strengthens the left stereotypes. This is an interesting one. I am disinclined to take it seriously. Instead, what Christians need to do is not ignore the sins of our quote-unquote allies, but instead we need to be very clear about where our differences with these people are. And perhaps even if it's a Richard Spencer type, we say something like, your kind isn't welcome here. That ends up being perhaps a bit hard, especially since conservatives have gotten so used to whenever someone agrees with them, you go and get really excited about it. The example that I would think of with that is when Kanye West released that gospel album, however many years ago that was, and all of a sudden everyone and their grandmother was pro-Kanye, which, I mean, that was a little bit weird, wasn't it? So we need to be clear where our di differences are, and at times we may even need to say, no, we cannot associate with them because they are so uh, alien to our beliefs about reality, our theological understanding of the world and about God. The third point that Shenvi ends up bringing up is that rightward criticism is a distraction. So it ends up being a distraction if yeah, I end up having to sit here and criticize someone who is to my right from the real issues that the left are causing. The issue that I end up having with this is that I don't necessarily agree that rightward 
criticism is a distraction from my goal. My goal isn't necessarily the destruction of the left. I don't see why that would be my goal. My goal is to glorify God. That is a theological statement. The purpose of humanity is to glorify God. I happen to believe that seeing the end of the left, or at least working towards its weakening, is part of that, at least in my case. But I should not confuse the goal with a step towards the goal. The fourth point that Shenvi brings up is, ignoring fringe elements on the right makes the mainstream right look sane by comparison. I disagree with this. It just says that we don't know how to actually kick out our crazies. I bring up Richard Spencer again as a point in that we really need to keep that guy out. It doesn't really matter whether I end up agreeing with him on anything or not. I don't want to be associated with him. And I'm actually going to praise the Joe Biden campaign for 2020 on this. As much as I don't really like Joe Biden, and I really wish he was not the guy in the White House right now, whenever Richard Spencer did endorse Joe Biden for the 2020 election, the Biden campaign at least had the mental capacity to reject that endorsement and condemn Richard Spencer, which I do believe is a good thing, and I believe that we should approve of that. So the fifth point made by Shenvi is that the Overton window has moved so far to the left that we should not oppose anyone who wants to move it to the right. Here we end up with issues that I know Shenvi ends up bringing up in his article of what constitutes a rightward shift, and he brings up, for example, libertarians. Where do libertarians fit on that? Well, libertarians are usually considered right-wing, and then you have uh, Nick Fuentes was another person that he brought up, and it's like, okay, Nick Fuentes is also considered right-wing, but he isn't necessarily any kind of related to the libertarians, and then he brings up a number of, I guess they'd be called paleocons, or perhaps even Andrew Tate was another example he brings up, in that Andrew Tate is very popular, and he is generally anti-left, but he isn't really considered right, and he doesn't necessarily want to move discourse to the right, that ends up being the points that he brings up. And I think those are fair points of what constitutes the right. So I think that knowing where we're going with a rightward shift is more important than just actually having a general rightward shift. We end up having a really weird Overton window, and so a slight rightward shift may cause more problems than having a pretty rapid rightward shift. At the same time, it also could be that we end up with the wrong kind of rightward shift. Generally, Islamic fundamentalists are considered a right-wing uh, a group. Do we really want to be moving in an Islamic fundamentalist direction? I personally don't, and for theological reasons, I don't, and practical reasons, I don't. I don't necessarily think that all rightward shifts are an improvement, and we need to keep that in mind. So Neil Shenvey also had another article called The Woke Theology Breaking Point that I think actually it doesn't just end up working on the woke. It also works for a more netter kind of thing where you say, all right, what is the acceptable bound of insert issue here? Where, where do you tow the line before it becomes unacceptable? So Christians need to be well versed in their theology enough to know, okay, here's the line, we don't cross it. Line in the sand, don't cross it. You can get up to it, don't cross it. But you also probably need to say something like, okay, you're getting close to the line, come on back, towards people that you respect that are moving towards the line. And he wrote this article in 2020. So he ends up having it specifically as a left-wing issue, generally evangelicals were moving left and they needed to have a woke break point, a point where they say, I cannot move any further this direction, non plus ultra. I think that this article actually ends up working just fine to say the other direction. All right, there's a boundary this direction. We cannot go any further this way. Line in the sand. Hey, you're going too far. Come on back. So as Christians, we need to remember that our purpose is not uh, political power. It's to glorify God. And to some extent, there is some uh, politicking within that, but that is not our primary objective. It ends up being a difficult line to walk. I will definitely agree with that, but it's a line that you have to be careful not to cross, and it's very easy to cross. I would assume that it would usually be a humility issue, and I mean, humility is one of those things that you think, oh, I'm never going to have issues with it, and then 
you all of a sudden have issues with it. And hopefully you realize before you've run off a cliff. So yeah, that was my thoughts on the topic. I thought it was an interesting article. Uh, definitely worth reading. I really like Shenvi's work. I think he's done a lot of good. I guess that's it. So uh, like, share, subscribe, whatever else you end up doing.